Good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you're all well and that you can hear me OK. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's webinar session. My name is Megan, one of the relationship managers here at HCA Healthcare UK. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing this evening's speakers. I'm going to run very briefly through a bit of their background and just a few housekeeping requests. Um, so speaking first this evening, we have Dr. Lorenzo Maschi, consultant in sports sports and exercise medicine at the Institute of Sports, Exercise and Health. Dr. Lorenzo works as a specialist consultant in various elite sporting environments. He is currently the lead sports physician for London Wasps Rugby and has previously been a consultant for various sporting events and teams, including tennis, rugby, football, swimming and more. Dr. Maskey's clinical interests include overuse tendon disease, iliotibial band friction syndrome, hip and groin disease, diagnostic ultrasound and ultrasound guided injections, including cortisone, platelet rich plasma and hyaluronic acid, as well as non-surgical treatment of osteoarthritis. We are also joined this evening by Mr. Chris Myers, clinical specialist physiotherapist. Chris is a highly experienced and specialized physiotherapist in musculoskeletal medicine and sports injuries. Chris has a master's in sports medicine and specializes in the assessment of treatment of tendon disorders. He is a visiting lecturer at UCL and Canterbury University and is currently involved in a large tendon research study. He has worked with many individual elite athletes with various tendon complaints and backgrounds. And Chris is one of few physiotherapists in the country to also be musculoskeletal sonographer and use, uses diagnostic ultrasound to diagnose muscle, ligament, tendon, joint and nerve problems. Now, before I pass over to our speakers this evening, we just have a few housekeeping requests. Hopefully, many of you already know that HCA UK outpatient centres and hospitals are now open for privately funded patients. I won't go into too much detail about this. However, we'll include some information in the chat box. Um, if you've dialed in using your phone this evening, as opposed to your computer audio, please can you just ensure that you've used the UK toll number as opposed to the USA number? Oh, apologies, all the phones going off at once there. Uh, you also notice in today's webinar, you'll not be able to turn on your camera or microphone in order to limit interference. And it's also my understanding we have already received a number of questions in advance. So thank you very much to those who submitted them. Um, however, if you did have any questions during the presentations, do pop them in the Q&A box to the right hand side of your screen. Um, and if unfortunately we don't have time to get round to your question, uh, we will answer them afterwards and send them out in the follow up email. Um, and with that, I believe that's enough talking from me. Uh, so whenever you're ready, Lorenzo, you Ready to kick Thank things you. off? Yep. Fingers crossed. Working. Uh, yes, we can see yes. your screen. Perfect. Uh, okay. Just needs to be in full screen mode at the moment. Uh, it's not working. <laughs> I've had this problem before uh, from the beginning. Okay, I will try something else. Uh, is that okay? I currently can't see your screen anymore. Um, I can just see yourself. Oh, here we go. So, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yep, Great. Full okay. screen. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so, um, as Megan was saying, I'm a, I'm a sports and exercise medicine consultant. I, uh, I've been working with Chris for um, must be over 10 years initially as um, uh, learning about ultrasound, ultrasound guided injections. I still help his company with some teaching, but we also have uh, an interest in, in tendon pathology and we've been doing a tendon clinic. Um, primarily based on lower limb and pelvis for the last uh, four to five years. So we thought about doing a little um, webinar on top 10 diagnostic and treatment tips uh, for patients who come in with tendon pain. 
So the focus really is not going to be on covering every single thing about tendon um, disease, because obviously, you know, we can speak days on it, but we're just really focusing on uh, the top 10 tips with a focus on diagnosis, uh, a little bit on imaging and primarily on rehab. Now, we always get questions about injections, you know, doing this injection, PRP, um, cortisone, you know, what do you think about this? I want the focus uh, tonight to be primarily on rehab, which I think is the most important component of managing patients with uh, tendon disease. And that'll be the bulk of, of Chris's um, talk. Uh, so, uh, and I'll, I'll be actually trying to answer the questions by a little green star here. So that reminds me to uh, answer some questions that were asked prior to the webinar. So when we talk about tendinopathy, we're, we're talking about um, a combination of tendon pain, patients with tendon pain and reduced function. Now, I'd encourage you to read this little consensus statement was published uh, about six to 12 months ago, uh, where it was agreed that the clinical term that we should use for tendon pain and, and reduced function is in fact tendinopathy. So we should be moving away from tendonitis, which is an acute inflammatory condition. Uh, and certainly we see inflammatory cells in tendinopathy, but we don't see that acute inflammatory uh, condition. And uh, tendinosis, tendinosis is a histopathological condition or, or, or a, a diagnosis. So we should be moving away from tendonitis and tendinosis and using tendinopathy. When we talk about tendinopathy, we're talking about a very complex pathophysiological process. So patients that come in often have structural and mechanical property dysfunction. So if you have a look under the microscope, they have collagen disarray and hypercellularity and increased blood flow. They also have subjective and objective uh, change in their function. Um, so that's important. And as well as that, some of them have pain and how they interrelate is very complex. Um, so we want to really get down to the practical component of, of how you how we manage uh, these patients. So first top tip, diagnostic tip is really try and get the, the right diagnosis. And in my opinion, I think it's harder than what it seems. Um, so I always ask the question, is this tendon pain? So patients often come in saying, I've got Achilles pain or I've got pain at the front of my um, patella tendon or, or they've got hip tendon pain. But is the tendon pain always a tendinopathy? So really the most important component of the assessment is the history. So I, I look for these uh, particular features. And if I don't have these features, then I think about other potential diagnoses. So the pain has to be focal. So I often use the, 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 the point the finger test. So if they're pointing with one finger, then I, I start thinking it's possibly tendinopathy. They point with more than one finger, then I think about other possible diagnoses. It's got to be load related. So the load that is most deleterious to tendons, which is springy load or energy storage and release load, often produces an increase in pain and also dose dependent. So the more times they actually do that load or loading, so higher the frequency, higher the volume, the more likely you will get increased pain. And it has to be inflammatory as well. So it's a warming up type pain, initially quite severe. And then as they continue on, it gets better. And then when they stop, it tends to get worse. Uh, so, and that pain usually lasts for, uh, from hours to days. So focal load related dose dependent inflammatory pain. And we certainly see this combination in certain tendons, such as the Achilles or patella tendon, sometimes in the plantar fascia. But interestingly, as we move away from this area, say, for example, the hamstring origin tendon, some patients present with focal load related dose dependent pain, but they also may present with referred component. So what we don't know here is that whether that referred component is related to the tendon itself or secondary to, um, you know, other structures being affected. So for, for the hamstring origin, we're looking at the sciatic nerve potentially. Things get a little bit more complicated when we talk about upper limb tendinopathy. So we're going to focus the talk today on lower limb, but certainly with upper limb tendinopathy, this relationship doesn't really exist that well. So certainly if you look at tennis elbow, for example, get a lot of referred pattern down the forearm or even up the arm. And in rotator cuff pathology, we can get referral down the arm uh, as well as referral in different parts of the shoulder. So it doesn't particularly hold as we get further up uh, in the upper limb tendinopathy. 
Another important feature when you're assessing patients with tendon pain is always ask the question, why? Why did this patient present with this tendon pain? So I want to ask about training. I want to ask about training intensity and volume. Has there been any changes? Has there been any changes up or down? So, you know, particularly when, when people are training for the London Marathon, for example, you often hear the uh, complaints of doing pretty well until I reached January. I got unwell for about three or four weeks and then I restarted running and I accelerated my running and then developed the Achilles tendinopathy. So you, you really want to ask the question why in, your assess in the assessment. Interestingly, with COVID, what I'm tending to see is an indirect effect. So not necessarily a direct effect of COVID infection, but an indirect effect of reduction in, in training and then an increase in training or a complete change in training. I had a lady yesterday present, uh, she was a power lifter and she decided during COVID that she, she would start running and then she developed a hamstring origin tendinopathy. So it, it's an increase, uh, of, of particularly on that deleterious load compared to what they normally do. So the second tip that I want to give you is you need to understand the limitations of, of conventional imaging. So that conventional imaging tends to be ultrasound and MRI scan. And what we tend to see with imaging is we see structural pathology. So for example, with ultrasound, you see collagen disarray, um, that's often termed echogenicity or hypoechogenicity. You see increased water, you see increased blood flow. You see the similar changes on the MRI scan, which thickening and increased signal. So what we're doing with the, with the imaging is we're looking at the structural pathology. But what we know uh, with tendon pathology, and this mimics many other areas of MSK pathology, is that the presence of pain doesn't necessarily correlate with pain. The presence of pathology, sorry, doesn't necessarily correlate with pain. So just because you've got an, a scan showing a patellar tendinopathy doesn't necessarily mean this patient has uh, patellar tendon pain. So it's very, very important that we correlate the two. So then, you know, some people ask, well, what's, what's the point of imaging if this relationship doesn't hold very strongly? So what I tend to do with imaging is use it in a very limited way. So if I see a patient, for example, with anterior knee pain, and I'm thinking, I'm not sure if they've got patellar tendinopathy, certainly you've got some atypical features. If I do an ultrasound scan, so this is an ultrasound scan of patellar tendon, and they have a normal image, then I start to question the diagnosis of patellar tendinopathy. So certainly if you've got a normal structure, it's very, very unlikely, not impossible, but very unlikely that your pain is coming from the tendon. And that's how I use sort of certainly point of care ultrasound or POCUS in my, uh, in my rooms. When I'm seeing a patient, I tend to use it in a very limited way. So this is a, uh, an example of a case. This is a 40-year-old amateur triathlete, very good runner, who had three months of load-related Achilles tendon pain, and had seen a very good physio, and he wasn't settling with high force isotonic exercises. When I examined him, he had some features of what I thought was Achilles tendinopathy, but also some atypical features. And this is what I found on ultrasound. So this is a completely normal ultrasound. So normal thickness, no echogenicity, no increased blood flow. So looking around his ankle, what I found was this. So this here was a, uh, this is a multi-loculated cyst, and this is the posterior malleolus. So this is sitting in the postlateral gutter. So what this patient had was a ganglion. So his pain, his, what he thought was Achilles pain, was in fact a five centimeter by two centimeter ganglion. And that's treated very differently to Achilles tendinopathy. So this is how I tend to use imaging but imaging in a very limited way. What imaging can't do is it can't be used as a sole diagnostic criteria. So you can't say just because you've got this pathology, you've got tendon pain. This is really important. It cannot be used to monitor treatment. Why is that? Because imaging is very subjective. It changes and the changes often don't correlate with pain. So it's almost impossible to use conventional imaging, ultrasound or MRI scan to decide on whether a patient is improving or not improving with rehab. And it also cannot be used to decide on surgery in the vast majority of cases. I think the exception to this would be, for example, a complete tear of a tendon where you're thinking maybe they need repair. But apart from that, you can't use imaging to decide on whether this patient needs surgery. 
and you need to be very cautious about calling partial tears. So this is a real black hole uh, in our um, understanding of uh, tendinopathy and certainly tendon pathology. And it's call, calling these as partial tears can be very problematic from a treatment perspective, but also it can be very problematic for the patient because once you call something a tear, then that potentially sets up fear of avoidance behaviour and certainly behaviours that you don't want. Uh, and certainly we need a lot more research into trying to pick up these partial tears, pick up true partial tears that, that will tear compared to those tears that partial tears that are part of the tendinopathy spectrum. So real black hole here. But there are other novel imaging modalities. So these are just some of the examples that we're using. And these imaging modalities uh, have an advantage over the conventional imaging because they're more objective. So they give us more of an objective um, uh, measurement of structure. So this is uh, UTC, so it stands for ultrasound tissue characterization, and it allows quantification of collagen alignment. So green and blue being organized structure, red and black being disorganized structure. And the advantage here is that you can use UTC, you can do a scan, and then a couple of weeks later, you can repeat the scan and look for the changes. It semi-quantifies tendon structure, unlike ultrasound, which uh, does um, uh, objectifies it pretty poorly. And you've also got this here, which is elastography. So this is shear wave elastography, it looks quite impressive. Uh, it measures the stiffness of the tendon. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, you, can, you can put this shear wave on a tendon and measure the stiffness, and then again, do it in a uh, objective way a couple of weeks later and repeat that. So I often, I often get asked the question, well, well, can we use these novel imaging modalities uh, in practice to decide on, on load monitoring? I think there's two parts to this question. First part is, can we use it for research? And I think the answer is yes. Certainly I've been using it for research. A lot of other groups, particularly groups in Australia and, and groups in Europe, Europe have been using it for research. Uh, the second part of the question is, can we translate that into clinical practice? And unfortunately, the answer that, up to that is, we're not sure. Certainly we don't have any evidence to suggest that using UTC or using shear wave elastography is able to improve our day-to-day -day management of patients, apart from maybe some very niche areas in diagnosis. So the answer to this is yes for research, perhaps for clinical translation, but we need more studies. Third top tip that I have is, if you've got a patient that has an atypical tendon case, think about underlying factors. So what are they? What are those atypical tendon cases? Well, certainly if they've got atypical pain. So what, what is that exactly? So if you've got pain that doesn't respond to rehab, you think of atypical pain. If you've got rest pain or night pain, you think about atypical pain. So anything that doesn't respond or doesn't present as a typical tendinopathy, focal load-related dose-dependent pain, I think about atypical pain. And certainly there's been an explosion in the last five or ten years of research that has shown that actually in some cases of tendinopathy, you're dealing with an underlying metabolic process. So what are they that I look for specifically? So it could be an inflammatory, such as a seronegative arthropathy. I think gout is a great mimicker in MSK practice. We need to be aware of gout, certainly in, patient, in, in practitioners that are uh, seeing patients in the cold face. This is a, a great mimicker, but certainly atypical tendon presentation. You need to think about drugs. So there's a group of drugs, antibiotic drugs called called fluoroquinolone, ciprofloxacin is part of that group, and that can cause tendon necrosis. And I certainly remember seeing a physiotherapist who presented with bilateral patellar tendinopathy, quite severe and very atypical. And he had multiple treatments, including rehab, injections, wasn't getting better. And in fact, no one asked him about whether he had fluoroquinolones. And in fact, what had happened was he was hospitalized with a kidney infection about a month before he developed the onset of symptoms, he had IV ciprofloxacin and then developed almost a full-blown tendinopathy. So we need to be aware of these drug-mediated uh, causes of tendon pain. We need to think about metabolic causes, certainly diabetes causes more severe tendon pain and might be a reason why our patients are not getting better. Uh, other conditions include hypothyroidism. We need to talk about we need to think about maybe some atypical uh, causes such as plantaris tendon that I'll mention in a little bit. So this we think is a, maybe a subgroup of patients with Achilles tendinopathy have plantaris interference and that's why they don't get better. So what do I do from a practical perspective? 
Well, certainly I ask about these these processes. I ask about skin problems, I ask about eyes. So I'm look, look, looking for psoriasis, uveitis, inflammatory bowel disease. I ask about medications, I ask about medical history, I ask about low back pain, I ask about swelling, if they had swelling in the hands or feet, if they had they woken up with a swollen toe, with a swollen finger. Do they have a family history of psoriasis or inflammatory arthropathy? And if there's any hint that, that they could have an underlying cause, I look at getting some blood tests. The blood tests are mainly in inflammatory screens, so looking at full blood count, ESR, CRP, but you're also looking at rheumatological screen and then perhaps some other screens depending on um, you know, possibilities on, based on the history and examination. So you need to think about these atypical cases. So this is a, a, an example of that atypical. Okay, so this is a 31-year-old. Uh, she was a, a fitness fanatic. She had a personal trainer who was also her physiotherapist, and she presented with a six-month history of tibialis posterior tendinopathy. That was not getting better. She'd seen a foot and ankle surgeon, saw a sports physician, uh, was diagnosed with mechanical overload, was given orthotics, had treatment, had two cortisone injections, wasn't really getting better. She had a mother who had sorry, arthropathy, but no other features to suggest an underlying condition. She came to me saying, look, things are getting worse. I'm not getting better with the treatment, and I just want to know whether you can help me. And so what I did was, you know, examined her, obviously, looked at her biomechanics, looked at the, the area of uh, pathology, and did, did an ultrasound. What I found here was very interesting, and the ultrasound was, in fact, this is the medium malleolus here. This is the tibialis posterior tendon. So you've got significant tenus synovitis and, and tendinopathy, tibialis posterior tendon. But what she also had was involvement of the FDL, flexitorum longus tendon. So this is really unusual. I said to her, look, I'm not sure what's going on here, but I've never seen this before. Uh, certainly never seen the FDL being infected before. Uh, you know, I think you might have an underlying inflammatory condition. So I had some blood tests, ESR normal, uh, sorry, CRP normal, ESR mildly elevated, saw rheumatologists who thought, no, I, don't, I really don't think she's got an inflammatory um, arthropathy. Uh, certainly just continue with um, anti-inflammatories and, and biomechanical factors. She rang me a couple of weeks later saying, look, this is, is getting worse. I'm actually in severe pain. And when I examined her the second time, she said, my ankle pain's okay. But in fact, what's, what's bad now is my foot. My foot's just got swollen. So she actually had developed an inflammatory arthropathy of the midfoot. And this really clinched the diagnosis of a seronegative arthropathy. So you need to think about these cases. It was the ultrasound that tipped me off. This lady potentially had something underlying. It was just atypical. But anytime you have an atypical problem, you need to think about, um, you know, potentially uh, a, um, a, an underlying cause. In this case, a seronegative arthropathy. And in this case, really life-changing for her because she went on medication, things settled down. She's now back to activity uh, and very happy. So, so quite. Uh, life-changing for her. Just really quickly about plantaris tendon. I think we underdiagnose and overdiagnose this condition depending on where you sit. Uh, plantaris tendon, we think, uh, interferes in some Achilles tendinopathy. I've done lots of research, both basic science and clinical findings. All I can say is just think about plantaris tendon. If you're dealing with an Achilles tendon, it's not getting better. So plantaris tendon starts at the knee and then traverses uh, in the calf between the gastrocnemius and ciliaus and inserts onto the medial calcaneus. And it's it's here close to the medial Achilles where we think it interferes. So this is the plantaris tendon here. And what we tend to see is we tend to see medial changes. So this is the UTC. This is one area where I think UTC does help somewhat is to define possible plantaris interference or plantaris friction. And when I, I've done some studies looking at this, so looking at clinical findings, I can give you this paper later, but primarily looking for medial Achilles pain uh, that's not settling. And uh, I was asked a question, you know, can you palpate plantaris tendon in these cases? The answer is with difficulty. I think you just need to think about it. And this is the area that you tend to see the interference. It tends to be in the medial Achilles close to the sleus muscular tendons junction. So I think Chris, you're on now. Great, thanks Lorenzo. Uh, I can share. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I could talk for about two days on this, um, but I've cut it down to some sort of key principles um, and hope you'll find it useful from a rehab point of view. Can you see that okay? 
Yes. Uh, we c can't see anything yet, Chris. Um, I can just see your lovely self at the moment. It says I'm sharing. Ah, perfect. Full screen. You can see? Yeah, I think I might have just had a connection issue myself. I just had a little pop okay. up. So, yeah, all fine. <laughs> no problem at all. So, our next point uh, is thinking about our rehabilitation and treating these patients. Um, we need to try and keep the load going through our tendon as high as possible. And certainly, see, I see an awful lot of lower limb tendons, particularly the Achilles tendon. And I'm surprised how many people are told still to stop running or stop doing their sport. We know that prolonged rest on tendons is very detrimental to the structure of the tendon. So we know that underloading a te tendon is actually just as detrimental as potentially overloading a tendon. So the first principle I have when I'm treating a patient is I want to keep the load going through the tendon as high as possible. And the way I think about it is if the load, so for example, the rehabilitation exercises that I'm giving, if they, they are not close to the load during their sport or running, then essentially the capacity of that tendon is getting less and less and essentially the longer they're not running or doing something that replicates what they want to do essentially the longer it is going to take you for them to get back to their full function there's some evidence to support this uh, silver nagel who has done some excellent research in the achilles and i would highly recommend um, you have a look at her uh, her studies but she did do a study that showed that it didn't make any difference whether or not somebody continued to run or didn't continue to run in terms of their um, outcomes. So I think that's really important. Patients don't come to us because they really, really want to do their rehab. They come to us because they want to, you know, improve their performance or they want to get back to or to increase their running. So it's important to bear that in mind when we're planning our rehabilitation. Now, many of you have, I think about this um, tendon staircase, uh, it's, it's not mine, it's been used many times in lots of articles. And patients want to be at that sport, um, they want to be at the top of the stairs, that's the way I think about it. They don't want to be at the bottom of the stairs. And as physios and rehab specialists, I think quite often we take them back down to the bottom of the stairs too often. Because as soon as you go down to the bottom of those stairs, you are reducing the capacity of that tendon and you're taking the capacity of that tendon further away from where they want to be. So if you often tell people to stop running, top their, stop their sport, stop any sort of um, uh, plyometric exercise and you start all the way back down at isometric exercises, then you are missing or you are at the bottom of the staircase and essentially you've got a long way to go until you're going to be able to have a tendon that withstands the capacity of their spore. So I try and go the other way and I try and keep them as high up that staircase as, as we can. So this is an example. This is my colleague Reese who introduces this exercise for me. So it's an active assisted plyometric exercise. And I think it's really important to keep the load as high as possible uh, and patients generally much, they, they much more enjoy doing of exercises than doing lots and lots of calf raises, which for anybody that's actually tried to rehabilitate an Achilles is extremely boring. I'm not saying there's not a place for them and I do use them, but we need to think about what component of that staircase we're working on to get them back to running. So our next tip is if we are gonna give them a rehabilitation exercise, then what are we going to give them? There's, there's, there's a few points I want to make here. First of all, there's a lot of information out there that says that loading exercises get Achilles tendons, for example, better all the time. And actually, if you look at the evidence, it's around 50 to 60 percent. So five to six out of 10 people return to full function with rehabilitation alone, which is good, but it's maybe not quite as good as 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 we think sometimes. So from a rehabilitation point of view, what do we know? Well, 
probably the most important thing is that the load that you prescribe, as we've already alluded to, has to be heavy and it has to be as close to the function that they need to be able to do with that tendon as possible and as early as possible in the rehabilitation phase. There's some evidence to say that we should do heavy slow resistance and we do know that this is going to be quite a long process uh, and it's going to be around 12 weeks of progressive load to improve the tendon stiffness and, and, and to improve the pain in these patients. Now I've put three times a week as a question mark um, because a lot of the patients I see, a majority of what I see are recreational runners, but I do see some elite and professional sportsmen as well. And obviously it depends what I prescribe to the patient. Uh, it depends on what they do. So if they're a professional footballer that needs to play twice a week, it's going to be very different to if it's a recreational runner who can load heavy three times a week. So I'll try and do three times a week and we'll talk about it a little bit more later on. But certainly if you're in season or you're a professional sportsman, putting three heavy, slow resistance sessions into your week is probably going to be too much. There is lots of evidence, well, there is evidence to support that if we want to change the structure of the tendon, well, first of all, we know it takes a long time and we know that the loads need to be heavy. There is minimal research looking at this in relation to tendinopathic patients. This is mainly done on asymptomatic patients. And I just want to highlight the load profile on the right hand side. And I think about this quite a lot is um, if you're walking, it's two to three times body weight. This will vary, but let's just say approximately running is six to eight times body weight and sprinting is eight to time to 12 times body weight. So this is a serious amount of load that's going through that tendon. So I just take it back to the first point. For every week that patient isn't running, the capacity of that tendon to carry out that sport or that activity is getting less. Now we do have to weigh this up against pain and we'll come on to that a little bit more. So what is heavy? Well, heavy is pretty heavy to be honest. Um, if we look at the Achilles tendon where most of the research for this has been done, if you're doing an eccentric exercise, so for example, many people still use the Alfredson regime, which I think is a nice regime to use, um, but you do need to make sure that the load is heavy enough. So you need to be going above, so in this case, 1.5 to 2 times body weight. Now, I'm not saying at any point you would start at that, but you do need to be pushing towards that with that sort of regime. But again, just to reiterate, there is no more evidence to do an eccentric program over a concentric program over an isometric or combining eccentric concentric with an isotonic exercise program. But what is important when you prescribe these exercises is that you're getting the load heavy enough. And these are the rehab goals that I, I try to focus on. And to reiterate my um, uh, the way that I work things with my patients is I give them um, this spreadsheet. Um, which you can see there, I just put in their uh, body weight and then it, uh, it's very straightforward. Um, it just calculates, you put in the load and it calculates what their percentage body weight is. So it's quite a nice way of looking at or, or informing the patient uh, uh, for the goals that they're trying to achieve. And then overall, we've got a total volume. That total volume can be quite useful, particularly when you're going from pre-season to in-season, because at the end of the day, your rehab needs to be as efficient as possible, as quick as possible, because patients want to be doing what they want to be able to do, the, 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 the things they enjoy doing rather than their rehab. Most patients don't particularly like doing their rehab. So here's a few ideas. So when you're seeing a patient, and again, I go back to my staircase, we've got isometric work and we've got strength. So let's just think about strength. And when we talk about strength training with tendons, when we're talking about heavy, slow strength training, we're trying to improve the stiffness of the tendon. OK, so when we look at all of these exercises, so I spend a lot of time. Oh, I've just lost my cursor. I spent a lot of time strengthening soleus. Seth O'Neill's done an awful lot of work on soleus to prove that this is a very, very important muscle. I'm sure all of these will play, but you get the idea. It doesn't really matter what exercise you use. You need to make sure the load is heavy. It is very hard to rehab a runner without a gym. 
because it's very hard heavy enough and be objective enough. Now you can do it, but one of the things I will always try and convince my patients to do is to get because you can then develop a programmer and generally speaking that is going to be good for their running. Running is really hard. We've seen the forces that go through the tendon and the body when you run. So getting them into a gym is a good excuse to conditioning program around it. Because guaranteed if they've got a weak calf, they've got a weak quad. So it's really important to get people into the gym and looking to try and achieve those different building goals that we've talked about. Now these exercises, I think physios are generally very good at giving out these exercises, but what we need to do is to take it to the next step. So again, if there's something else that we take from this talk, it's that we need to, or I would suggest, and there is only limited evidence for this, that we need to try and add in plyometric work of some description as soon as possible. It's more interesting than the other stuff. And what plyometric work does is it does replicate more the activity that you need to do. So again, if we go to our staircase, you can see towards the top of the stairs, we've got our plyometrics, we've got a bit of speed. We've got those exercises that need to that store and release energy. And for a tendon, these, although they're heavy loads, for a tendon, they're not high loads, okay? There's a difference. For a tendon, a high load is something that involves storing energy and releasing it, so it's your stretch shortening cycle, and that's pushing towards the higher loads. So again, just a few examples, single leg hop, um, double leg hop, uh, we've got double leg jumps, I use lots of double leg jumps, single leg jump, trying to keep the knee stiff. Um, so we uh, you need too much to do the exercises. And then I really like the box jumping onto a box is often where I will start. It's much easier to jump onto a box than, than to jump off a box and is that are putting through the tendon. And then in, in the end, obviously, you need um, jumping onto a box and jumping off a box. That gives you a few ideas. Now, the key thing here is that the exercises that I've shown you here improve tendon stiffness. Plyometric training, from the evidence that I'm aware of and what I've read, doesn't improve the tendon stiffness, but what it does do is it improves the joint stiffness and the jumping performance. And obviously, as part of that, improves the overall performance of the kinetic chain. And I think this is an area that we miss quite often. And this has been supported again by some research by Silbernagel that showed that although patient symptoms improved and they got stronger, some of their functional performance tests, such as hopping for distance or submaximal hopping, didn't actually improve. And that may be one of the reasons why recurrency rates of Achilles can be very high and patella tendon. So maybe we're not quite finishing off their rehab. Now, Silbernagel has also done a recent article. It's quite complicated, so we haven't got too much time to go into it, uh, but it's a good one for you to read. But it just reiterates what I think about and the points that I'm trying to get across today. So tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. So this is the loading index. So basically, tier one is the lowest load, tier four is the highest load for the tendon. So if you look at these four here, these are generally rehab exercises that try to improve tendon stiffness. Seated heel raise, single leg heel raise, squat, step down, okay, give or take a few other things that they do in there. These were low load exercises with a low index, whereas the higher load exercises um, were the more plyometric type exercise. So it just reiterates the point that I'm making. And you can see here, just to explain the graphs, each graph has got your running, and your walking um, plotted across. On the left-hand side, you've got your relative to body weight load. This is the Achilles tendon. And then you've got, as, as this is time through the exercise. So you can see that the plyometric training are the ones that get the load up towards the running. But I go back to my original point. Every time they're not doing the sport they want to do, they're re you're reducing the capacity on their tendon. You're taking them further away from their goal. So these exercises are very useful for keeping the load in the tendon high.
But the bottom line is, what is the best exercise if you want to run? What is the best exercise if you want to play football? It's running or playing football. That will replicate, obviously, what you need and replicate the, you, the load that you need it. So my first of all, I will always try and keep them doing what they want to be able to do. And the way that I will work out whether or not they should is through the irritability of the tendon. And I will assess that through the history and through different um, provocation tests to see how robust the tendon is. And together, what I'm trying to do is to work out the load tolerance of the tendon. And that leads us into one of our other points, uh, which is about, and I've just skipped one because this leads in nicely, is whether or not those exercises and whether or not that running should be painful. Well, actually, it may be useful for it to be painful. Most of the tendons that we see and most of us that we see in clinic, they are chronic tendinopathies. We don't think that the pain is all that useful. And I think it's really important that we use the right language, as Lorenzo's already alluded to, to try and reassure the patients. The first thing you should say to a patient with Achilles tendon pain to get rid of the fear is tell them that the risk of rupture is no more than if they didn't have pain. So it's really important to reassure people. You'll, you'll be surprised as soon as you say that, people go, oh, well, that was what I was worried about. Oh, fine, I'll crack on, I'll keep running. So you do need to try and reduce that fear in these chronic tendinopathies. It's exactly the same as low back pain. We know that there is fear and fear avoidance in tendon problems. And I don't always use a pain monitoring scale because I think everybody's tolerance is different. Everybody's five is different. Generally, if I was using it, a pain monitoring tool, I would be happy with anything from naught to five. But I quite like saying to the patient, just if you're comfortable with running with that pain, then, then run with it. Because what I'm more interested in is the irritability of the tendon, which I believe is more reflected in how it behaves over the next 24 hours. And if the irritability is high, then basically the pain will just get worse and worse. If the irritability is low, they may get pain during it, but it doesn't increase after, or they don't feel it much after in the morning stiffness isn't worse. If that's the case, then that's a bit of a green light to keep running or even increase what they're doing. So it's really important to explore that with your patient and sit down with them and, and talk about that, because I think a lot of the time it's it, that is just as important as exactly what rehab exercise you put in there. So just going back, sorry to skip about, but I often get asked about in season, off season, how do you plan your week? So for those that aren't working in elite sport, I really like using the four R's, which is run, rest, which is relative rest, rehab and repeat. So day one is run or carry out their sport. And you may have had to have modified that. Day two is relative rest. Day three is doing your rehab and day four is repeat. So those are the four R's that I quite often use. So what you have to do is you have to work out, and we've already talked about it today, is what is low load, what is medium load, and what is high load for a tendon. And essentially, particularly through the rehab phase, before you get to the end, you need to make sure that you avoid hide loads on back-to-back -back days. That will change in the end, but that is certainly what I use. And that those four R's seem to fit in with that nicely. It's important to have some rest or relative rest the day after your heavy load. So heavy load is either going to be lots of plyometric or hopping work, or it may be running and plyometrics. But that doesn't mean on the days that they have a rest day that they're not doing anything. And the, the last thing to remember is that your physio exercises is, are not high load they're heavy load but they're not high load your rehab is essentially in that middle zone so you don't need a day off after that and just the last point um in terms of the the program design um if we look at this uh there's basically a tipping point where your rehab is a priority or playing sport or running is a priority and as you go through the rehab phases as your, re as your sport increases and your pain gets less, then your rehab has to reduce and your sport 
has your sport will go up and your rehab has to reduce so you can't keep people loaded three times a week doing heavy concentric eccentric exercises like this three times a week you've got to reduce it down and in my in-season uh, athletes i use a heavy load program uh, which is a static exercise but again this is 1.2 to 1.4 times body weight or even more. And that's based on the work from Aaron Paxis, which was done on asymptomatic tendons. We don't have it on symptomatic tendons, but it did show that it increased stiffness. So that's a five second hold. That is a isometric exercise. It is nothing to do with an analgesic isometric hold, which is done at a lower load um, and uh, gets a lot of press um, and has a role but it's not going to do anything for tendon stiffness. So as your rehab reduces and your sport goes up, you've, you're doing that because you've got to reduce your overall, you, you've got to manage your overall load on the tendon. And my last tip, which is tip number seven, is tendons take time. They take 12 weeks basically to really, really improve. This is an excellent study by Miles Murphy. It's worth a read. Now, there's a little peak at around four weeks where there's a 10 point change, which and 10 points is essentially your minimally clinically important difference. And you can see there's a bit of a peak at four weeks. We know that tendon morphology doesn't change at four weeks, so there must be other um, mechanisms in place. But I, offer, I say to patients at four weeks, you should know whether or not this tendon is going to improve with loading. It, it won't be perfect but you should be going in the right direction. You should be winning, you shouldn't be losing. So you need to, the other thing is to manage the patient's expectations right from the beginning. We know these take time. Um, and I think that's why it's really important. One of our jobs as a physio is to keep people as motivated as possible. And doing single leg calf raises 12 for 12 weeks is very, very boring. And I think our job is to keep people motivated and keep those loads as close as possible to the tendon load that they need for their sport that they want to carry out. Back to Lorenzo. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, Chris. It's Megan. Um, I can hear you. Um, I'm not sure if Lorenzo can, but um, I can. Thank I you can. Both. Oh, perfect. Uh, thank you both for an excellent talk. I've, I've, still, uh, got, I've still got a few more to do. Okay. Oh, that's <laughs> five fine. minutes. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Can I share my? Uh... Yes, I believe Elise should be doing that for you now. Apologies. I thought we was ready for questions. Then I was too keen. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> This has gone a bit uh, <laughs> over time, but that's fine. Oh, the blame game started already. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it was always going to happen. It was always going to happen. I knew it. Yeah. Can you see that? Is that? Uh, yeah, we can see that. Full okay. Screen. Fine. So I, I'm going to spend five minutes talking about eight, nine, and ten, uh, which is where it should be. I think you know there are, as Chris was saying, there's about 50, 60, 70 percent. I would say 70 percent improve with exercise therapy. Um, and then we use adjuncts, and I think we need to be very cautious about adjuncts, particularly injections, because they can cause harm. And certainly I see it in, in practice because I work with a surgeon who sees end stage tendon disease. Uh, this is a lady that had hyaluronic acid injected into the front of her tendon and she developed um, a, a severe soft tissue reaction. Certainly I've gone away from hyaluronic acid generally and even using it in joints. I think if you inject uh, hyaluronic acid into soft tissue, uh, I think there's a chance you could set up an inflammatory reaction. I don't, I don't use it. Uh, this is a rugby player that had PRP injections into his tendon, but he had 10 uh, over the course of the season. Certainly, if one or two aren't going to work, then certainly 10 aren't going to work. And this is a high volume injection with cortisone, and you can see the track mark here from the high volume. So, this is an inadvertent injection of um, uh, probably of cortisone into the tendon and that causes necrosis. So, you just can be really cautious if you're injecting substances, particularly. When you're using adjuncts, you've got to think about, you've got to confirm a diagnosis. You've got to be convinced that they've failed rehab. Uh, it's a stepwise approach. And certainly I'd be guided by the patient. So the 
So the patient really is is directing the treatments and, and not me, and I'll give them the options. So what are the options for um, tendinopathy? We've got GTN patches. I'd encourage you to read this systematic review, which is open access, looking at uh, the use of GTN patches to improve pain. Uh, I certainly use it for a lot of chronic tendinopathies. We just need to be aware of some of the side effects, and I tend to use it for two months. But I think it's very good because patients um, part of it might be that they've, they've become more compliant because they're sticking a patch on every day uh, onto their tendon. So these tendon patches actually go, this is an example of a tennis elbow patch that you would use. Um, and I, I'd encourage you to read that paper. I think if we look at shockwave, lots has been talked about shockwave. But certainly if you look at the evidence, there's lower level evidence. Whether it's focused shockwave versus radial shockwave, we don't know based on the evidence. I, I certainly... Uh, use shockwave uh, in limited form for maybe hamstring origin, sometimes use it for insertional Achilles tendinopathy and greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to use it as a second line treatment. I think with injections, this is a narrative review that I helped co-authored, I co-authored, um, and I, I can give you that um, paper if you wish, summarising uh, the use of ultrasound guided injections for tendinopathy and, and the evidence. If we look at the evidence, we find that cortisone uh, certainly gives short-term relief, potentially medium-term harm, particularly for some tendons like tennis elbow. I still use cortisone for some tendons, but, but certainly avoid them for large weight-bearing tendons. High-volume injection, if you, I mean, if you look at the evidence for high-volume injection, uh, certainly suggests that high-volume injection with cortisone is just a cortisone injection. Uh, short-term positive effect, similar to cortisone. And then PRP injections, I, I've spoken about PRP before. I'm not an advocate of PRP for tendons, but certainly if you look at the evidence, there might be some evolving evidence for tennis elbow, uh, maybe for plantar fasciopathy, but there are some limitations to this paper. And really the ninth point is surgery as an absolute last resort. Certainly this study here shows that surgery is no different to physiotherapy and sham surgery uh, generally. Uh, and if you look at for teletendinopathy, uh, the success is 50% equal to physiotherapy. Um, so, and certainly if you don't improve with tra traditional surgery, and this is where they cut the tendon open and stitch the tendon up, then I think that could be a career ending injury. So you need to be really, really cautious about surgery and use it as a last resort. I work with a, a shoulder, uh, a surgeon that has um, more of a niche area in, in plantaris uh, surgery and uh, tendon debridement. These are some of the papers that I've written uh, on this area, but certainly even in these cases, even in patella tendon debridement or plantaris excision, I would tend to use it uh, almost as a last resort uh, after you've failed uh, rehab. There's some um, movement away from surgery and, and maybe to percutaneous, um, um, percutaneous debri patella debridement and Achilles tendon debridement. I won't mention too much here. And lastly, the 10th point is just be aware that tendons are difficult. Um, you know, even people that work with tendons all the time find them difficult. They take time. They're unpredictable. Um, you know, I think we need to avoid blaming the practitioner. You know, poor expertise or the patient not doing their exercises. And I think it's really, really important that we set expectations early. This is not something that is going to get better in one, two, or three weeks. It often tends to get better after many months of, um, specifically, of loading and load management. Just finally, if anyone's got questions, very happy to answer them. For all those research papers, if you go onto my website, there's a list of published papers on injection therapy and um, and other sort of niche areas that I've done some research on. Um, you've got full access to those papers. And that's it. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Have we got, have we got time for questions? Probably not. We can probably do a couple of questions. I don't know if there's any interesting ones in particular that were submitted beforehand. Um, I've kept track of all of the questions that come through the chat box um, today. So what we'll most likely do is send these across to you guys um, to answer and we'll send out in the follow up email. Um, but I believe you're welcome to ask a reader through a couple of the questions that you received, perhaps. Up to you guys. Can we do them from the Q&A on the right? Yeah, sure. Have you got views about yourself if you wanted no, to? Just be some. Perfect. Uh, 
So Rebecca Christensen totally agree on irritability. Why not use running as their plyometrics and risk is that plyometrics increases irritability and result in less running. Um, yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. I think uh, ideally running is your plyometrics. Absolutely. But I certainly have some patients where uh, they I, they may only run once a week, but they and they can't quite get to running the second time in the week and therefore I would give them a plyometric program alongside um, their running program. But yeah, ideally plyomet your plyometrics is your running, um, but obviously that's not always the case that they can do it. Um, so yeah, so sometimes it's a combination. I've got a question for you, Chris. You're not allowed <laughs> a question. <laughs> yeah, I'm allowed questions. So, so going on that, on that point, uh, I mean, on a lot of, there's been a lot of research looking at you know, maybe starting plyometrics early, quite early in the process, and not not necessarily, you know, going along the 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 increasing load, starting with heavy slow resistance and moving to plyometrics, but actually starting them very early. So as soon as the patient presents, what do you think about that? So, for example, I, Igor, Igor Sanchez has done some some work on that. What what do you think of that of that sort of thought? So, I was I was traditionally I would go through those stages quite clear, clear, carefully. So I would build up their strength so they can achieve those heavy loads that we've talked about, those loading goals. And then I would add in plyometrics and then I would add in running. I think over the last six months, and I've spoken as you have to Igor at length about this, and I think bringing that on earlier, and and I think, and he's gonna do a, a large RCT on it, I believe, uh, that I think that there is something in that. And I, and I think the reason being is is exactly what I presented is that the load through the rehab exercises is very different to the load when you're running and playing sport. Um, I also think that fear is very important, is a big issue here, particularly with the Achilles. And I think if you can replicate what they need to be able to do as much, as quickly as possible, mm. I think you can negate some of that fear that develops over time with these chronic tendons. The, the argument against that is that you need to build up base strength before you you then move into plyometrics. Yeah. Um, so you've got someone who's probably had Achilles tendinopathy for six months, say, for example, they've actually lost some strength. So the question then is, do you need, how do you decide whether you go with your plyometrics to begin with yeah. or whether you wait and build the strength? So the, 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 the converse to that is you need to have strength before you can do plyometrics. What do you think of that? I think you have to have a level of strength, absolutely. But most of the runners that I see, um, most of the runners that I see do have weak calves. And so right. I, I will still strengthen them, but I think the principle of bringing pliers a little bit earlier. But it depends. If they come in and they can do three calf raises, then do you know what, actually? I, I might get them doing a very simple, um, uh, uh, just a double leg jump. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think they will be able to do that. But it and, all comes down to irritability. If they and, can't withstand the load, then I won't put it in. So do you if they use, can, then I will. Do you use a uh, you know um, a, a marker pre pre running like double hop number of double hops, single hops before you get them doing um, plyometrics or running? Um, I don't have a specific figure, but they would need to tolerate around three to five minutes of some sort of double leg or single leg hopping but I don't use that as a I will get people running as soon as possible so I won't I won't necessarily wait till they've tried to run for five minutes on the treadmill yeah, yeah because I think they might still be able to do that and if they can if they can't hop but they can do five minutes on the treadmill I'll skip that stage and get them running yeah yeah um so you've there's a lot of moving parts I suppose and everybody's slightly different yeah yeah that's where we shouldn't be too rigid with what we're prescribing yes and then another practical component is you talk about plyometrics. What does that mean from a pra very practical perspective? How many do you do? Uh, you know, what, what's the progression? Because we don't really talk about the progression of plyometrics as far as dose and how many you do. I don't, I don't know that we have much to go on. The only thing we have to go on is Silver Nagel has in her protocol, which she published ages ago, she has some plyometric type exercises off a, yes. uh, off a, a, so we have that in terms of dosage. 
and we have eagles which works out about two to three i think it's about 300 contacts per session. around 300 but it depends again when you're fitting your plan over a week but i mm. don't think we know but i um i mean you could work out how many times they you know went during running how many times they have a contact um but it is different running and plyos are different the other thing to bear in mind is that for example i think i said to it but jumping onto a box you know is a lot easier than jumping off a box yeah, yeah. so and then jumping you know just across the floor is going to be easier than jumping off a box so you, you know you need to you need to progress your plyometrics from that point of view and, and double leg to single leg but i find a lot of patients can do double leg quite quickly um in there and I, I think i think a lot of it comes back to that fear avoidance type thing and keeping to, as close to the top of the stairs as possible but if you're not if you're at the top of the stairs and the tendon's just flaring up then clearly you've got to back off but before you might have said just stop all plyometrics but what i'm saying is actually is there some plyometric even if it's active assisted double leg hopping that you can keep in there hmm. Good. Brilliant. I think we'll um, call it there, guys, as we're at half seven. And unfortunately, sure. I think you might have a bit of homework as we have had so many questions come through during the duration of the talk. So right. um, okay. I just want to so thank you guys it's again. £10 pounds per answer. <laughs> <laughs> Ones are a little bit tough. Oh, you can take that up with Kelly and the team. <laughs> Um, but thank you guys so much for your time this evening um, and for such interesting talks and thank you for everyone that joined us and for being so engaging and asking so many high value questions. I think it would make for an interesting Q&A and it's just unfortunate that we don't have the time today, but I think by the sounds of the chat, um, everyone has thoroughly enjoyed themselves this evening. So thank you guys so much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and as usual, everyone, you'll receive a link to a short feedback survey following today's talk. We really do value your feedback in order to tailor these sessions to what you'll be needing and wanting to hear about over the upcoming months. Um, and obviously following that, you'll get your CPD certificate and answers to all your questions. So thank you again, everybody. Uh, do stay safe um, and speak to you soon.